Hello and welcome to our Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I want to talk about the, the opening of Wizard's First Rule by Terry Goodkind. Now, I know that usually when I go through a prologue, I read it, basically I read it aloud, I go through it word by word, by word and sentence by sentence to sort of break it all down. But what I want to do with this, I am going to put it up on screen. I am going to show it and I'm going to talk about a couple of general points. But the focus of this one is it's, it's kind of complicated because there are some really good points I want to point out here. And then something that Goodkin does that to me feels awkward. And I want to explain why it feels awkward. And I want to sort of point to why from, say, a craft perspective, a technical perspective, we might describe it, say, as bad. But from a reader perspective, we might describe it as good. And it's this sort of separation between when we talk about good prose, because we are never defining what we mean by good, we're not defining the context, we're not explaining the frame of reference for how we are saying good. And all of us define it differently. An author might look at something from a craft perspective and say that is good or bad. Another author might look at it as a reader and say, I can see why the other author disagreed with this, but as a reader, I appreciated them doing that. And what Goodkind does, and I'm only looking at the, the first, uh, first five or six paragraphs, he, he transitions through a very standard opening that is done well and a couple of things to talk about and then there's this slightly muddied thing and i think it will come down to talking a bit about psychic distance it'll come down to discussing narrative perspective it'll come down to the type of narration that we are experiencing and the organization of that information and different technical ways i'll, I'll suggest a couple of different ways that it could have been done differently, that may have, would have alleviated my concerns. Whether or not they are concerns or problems that you have with it, that, I, I'm not saying that this is bad. I'm saying from a certain perspective, we could describe it as bad. But from a different perspective, it, it's fine, it's good. That's what I'm trying to get across in this. It's not as clear cut as this is terrible. This is bad, this is clearly bad. It's something slightly more awkward than that. So looking at this very first paragraph, you can see it was an odd looking vine, dusky variegated leaves hunkered against a stem that wound in a stranglehold around the smooth trunk of a balsam fir, sap drilled down the wounded bark. I'm just gonna stop there because it's a great opening. It starts with, it's an odd looking vine. There is a perspective here that is saying the rest of what is around is normal, this one thing looks different. So it is a perception of the event from a perspective. You know that because there's a judgment being made about the vine. But also, I like dusky variegated leaves. Like, Goodkind, the, the actual word by word or sentence work that Goodkind is using, I like this, uh, which, you know, might sound strange to people who would assume that I dislike Goodkind's writing. That is an entirely separate conversation about the rest of the books and what's in the books and their content. What I'm talking about here is what is actually on the page, not the overall story or, or any of those elements. And that moment of a stem that wound in a stranglehold, and then in the next sentence, sap drilled down the wounded bark. The fact that we have wound and wounded I think is really well done. This is one of those things that I love to see. Authors playing with the different ways that words can look alike, be confused for one another. At lead and led, L-E-A-D, lead, and led, L-E-A-D, the metal, but also then led, as in past tense of lead, which is L-E-D. You know, playing around with these things is one of the joys of the written word. And sometimes I think 
this is part of what can make an audiobook different from reading the the physical text because when you hear words you're not necessarily aware of the little things that an author has done this way and th there is actually a moment at the the end of the section that is a perfect illustration of that and again not saying audiobooks are bad i'm saying that listening to an audiobook is a different experience to reading the physical text um there are strengths and weaknesses to both, but that's an aside. Anyway, looking at this opening, it establishes something strange, something startling. There's your hook. Then it goes into just developing that strangeness a bit more. So odd looking is relatively neutral. Something is standing out. Odd is slightly pejorative, but not overly pejorative. And then we get into wound in a stranglehold against the smooth trunk of a balsam fir. So the variegated leaves of the vine are being contrasted against the smooth trunk of the balsam fir. The fact that it is a stranglehold is introducing violence into it. And the use of the word wound there is already suggesting through its connotative, or sorry, not connotative, it's suggestive through uh, implication, the wound and that violence, because we recognize the similarity in the words. And then sap drilled down the wounded bark. So the violence is continuing. The vine is violent. We have established this horrific, almost parasitic, monstrous plant that is attacking and killing another plant. That comes across very strongly. And the fact that the sap drills, the vine is taking on a sense of animalism, that it is predatory, that it is a creature that is attacking, not just a natural um, ivy climbing on a wall, that this is coming across as very predatory and animalistic, as if it is a, a creature of some kind that is attacking something. All of that is being conveyed through Goodkin's use of these violent images and the fact that the sap drooled, that is animalistic because sap can drip. Drooling is associated with a slavering jaw, with, with a mouth. Um, and then we have the tree itself trying to voice a moan. So the personification, this idea, uh, of the limbs slumping. So not even talk, yes, we talk about tree limbs, but the use of limbs is again tying in very neatly to that sense of an animal attacking another animal in particular human and when we get voice a moan that again all of this is being suggested so i love this opening and when it finishes with that the the pods on the vine almost seeming to look warily about for witnesses that this vine is checking to see if anyone is witnessing it killing this tree. I think this is an exceptional, beautiful, and wonderful opening. It really establishes a tone. It establishes a very vivid image of something monstrous happening. And the very next sentence, so we, we see this thing, this vine that is killing this tree in a predatory, animalistic way. And the very next paragraph brings in the person who is perceiving it. It was the smell that first had caught his attention. So now it's as if there was a close-up on this vine and the camera has panned back and we're now standing with, right behind the cameras, right behind the person who is viewing this. This is really good sort of attention to the perspective, the control of the perspective and how the element is slowly being drawn back to the element now being situated in scene and even bringing in an additional sense, smell. So we had, it was odd looking. We had the drooling of the sap, which is obviously quite tactile. We had the fact that it was like a voice trying to moan in the cool, damp morning. All of these tactile sensory experiences. And then in the very next sentence, the very next paragraph, it opens with 
smell. So this is creating a deep, immersive reality. This is good writing. And then a smell like the decomposition of something that had been wholly unsavory, even in life. You thought it smelt bad on the outside, said Han Solo. This is something that smells absolutely rotten, but it is so rotten that even when it was wholesome, it still smells bad. That we are getting a very strong sense that the vine is evil and corrupt and disgusting. And then we get our perspective name. Richard combed his fingers through his thick hair as his mind lifted out of the fog of despair. So with this line, we now know it is in limited semi-omniscient third person. How do we know this? We have the external stimuli. We have the view. It is limited to the perspective of Richard. But not only that, we get insight into Richard's mind because his mind lifted out of the fog of despair. That is something internal to him. So we know the narrator has access to Richard's inner life as well as what Richard can perceive. All of that is now confirmed. He scanned for others but saw none. Everything else looked normal. Do you need everything else to look normal? No, you don't. It's already established by it was an odd looking vine and everything else then is, he didn't see any other vines. So everything else by default would be normal, but it's confirmation. So this is the first suggestion that the style that Goodkind is going to employ while he is not afraid to use um, interesting language, dusky variegated leaves, um, you know, variegated, nice saying that someone actually, you know, in, embraces what the English language can do. While Goodkind is going to embrace those aspects of language, things are going to be told to the reader, not in the show and tell sense, but are going to be made very apparent. So here we have confirmation. Everything else looked normal. It is confirmation of what we could have ascertained from the information already present. And then we have a very nice sort of tracking moment to expand the scene. The maples of the upper Van Forest were already tinged with crimson. So we start with the, in the first paragraph, it's a vine on a balsam tree. Then we're told with the upper Van Forest, it's full of maples, which are already turned crimson, which is a signifier of the time period, i.e. autumn, proudly showing off their new mantle in the light breeze. So it is newly autumn. With nights getting colder, confirmation then that we have moved into autumn. It wouldn't be long before their cousins down in the Heartland Woods joined them. Heartland, really nice uh, expression here because although Heartland would suggest deer woods, the land of deer in woods, but heart as in the center, and it is down. So we're getting a sense of elevation going down into a valley. So balsam fir, we associate with those sort of higher elevations, then descending down into the maples, which are at the upper van, which could be a distance, but with this sense of elevation works, going down into the Heartland Woods, going down into the center where it is still dark green. So we have green going up into the red. And that fact that crimson is being pointed out here, even though it's with the maple trees, is still subtly tying into the wounded bark and the, this drooling sap and this tree being killed. But that violence is still being continued with that little hint of crimson. So all of this stuff in the first two paragraphs, I think is actually really, really well done. We have lots of senses engaged. We have a strange thing that we're looking at. We have our point of view and point of view character being established. We have a sense of the broader world that it's in. We know what time of day it is because it's the cool, damp morning air. And we know what time of year it is, that it's newly autumn. All of this has been established very clearly and effectively and visually with all of these senses in the first two paragraphs. And here we get the transition that I don't like. Um, this is where I start to have a problem with what Goodkind is doing. 
So the next four paragraphs, having spent most of his life in the woods, Richard knew all of the plants, if not by name, by sight. This is not about the scene. This is now explaining Richard's backstory. This is info dumping about Richard. So we saw the ivy, or sorry, the, the, um, the vine. We saw the balsam tree it was attacking. We see the woods as Richard looks around, tracing his eye about to see if everything else is normal. All of that is established in the scene. And now we're getting backstory about Richard. This is not in the scene. This is information about Richard's past. This is info dumping to the reader, information about Richard. So he knew all the plants, if not by name, by sight, because his friend Zed had taken him along hunting for special herbs. Little hint about who Zed is there. Um, he, now this is interesting. He had shown Richard which ones to look for, where they grew and why, and put names to everything they saw. And we contrast that line, put names to everything they saw, with the opening line of this, which says, Richard knew all of the plants, if not by name, by sight. And this confuses things. Why throw in the contradictory evidence here that Richard doesn't know them all by name, but Richard knows them all by name because Zed taught him. It's not meant to read that way. But that is something that suddenly comes up in this paragraph. So not only are we taken out of the scene that we were previously in without it being signaled in any way, that now we're getting this contradictory backstory. This vine, though he had seen it only once before and not in the woods. You, right, so we, we had this reminiscence about how Richard knows about plants. So it is tangentially linked to the scene. But this is clearly internal and backstory. And then it's this vine, though, he had seen only once before and not in the woods. So he does recognize it. It's, it's not necessarily that odd then. It's something he has seen before. He had found a sprig of it at his father's house in the blue clay jar Richard had made when he... So now we are again going into Richard's backstory, reminiscences his internal life and his history. We are not in the scene. Now, it is still being spurred by something in the scene. We have in that first one, having spent most of his life in the woods, he knew all of the plants. The next one, this vine. So again, trying to point to something in the scene to say this vine. But what we then have is backstory about Richard made a blue clay jar when he was a kid and gave it to his dad. And his dad traveled and people of means came to see him and his dad enjoyed traveling. And then we get the next paragraph. From a young age, Richard had liked to spend time with Zed while his father was away. So now we're kind of, we're jumping back to talking about Zed again, this time trying to tie it into connecting it to his dad. But then we move on to Richard's brother, Michael was a few years older. So this is all backstory. This is explaining all of this information about who Richard is, who Michael is, who Richard's father is, who Zed is. It's getting it all out of the way so the story can move on. And then we get to the last sort of major paragraph that I'm looking at. On the day three weeks before when Michael had come to tell him their father had been murdered, Richard had gone to his father's house, despite his brother's insistence that there was no reason to go, nothing he could do. So if you look, we've gone from the scene that is immediately happening with the vine to when Richard was a kid, he used to go walking uh, in the woods with Zed, to when he was young, he made this blue pot for his dad, that when he was a wee bit older, his brother had gone to do... Uh, these meet these people of means while Richard preferred to spend time with Zed and Richard's and Michael's father had spent time trading that we're jumping around through time. Now, yes, we've, we've progressed from when he was very young to getting slightly older to now three weeks ago, his father died, was murdered. And that's what we're now finding out about. 
And then we get to um, just the very end of this, and it is something I want to leave on a very, very positive note. Yet he had heard them talking in hushed tones of the stories and the wild rumors of things come out of the boundary of magic. And it is those two words, of magic, in a paragraph, on their own, in a sentence, on their own, in a paragraph, on their own, emphasize the importance of it. And again, this is something that is very difficult to communicate in an audiobook. Because in an audiobook, yet he had heard them talking in hushed tones of the stories and the wild rumors of things to come out of the boundary of magic. That pause could have been a comma. But here we see it's not just a full stop and new sentence. It's a full stop and new paragraph. It really emphasizes of magic. And that is something that really comes across in the written medium and very powerfully comes across in the written medium. And it's much harder to communicate in the ebook form. Sorry, in the, in the audiobook form. And that is why I, I talk about the two being different. Not that audiobooks are bad, that audiobooks aren't a good way to encounter and consume and interact with narrative, but they're not the same as reading. There are differences, and this is one of them. So what I want to talk about here, about these four paragraphs, really, the first two I love, they're very straightforward, very um, understandable in what they're doing. But these four paragraphs, from a reader point of view, this is great. This is laying out for us very clearly, who is Richard? Richard has a dad. He has a, a, an older mentor called Zed who taught him all about herb lore and plants and is slightly an odd wild man. That's all established. We know that Richard's father was a trader and spent long times going away and was interested in the excitement and adventure of traveling and finding new things. Richard has a desire to learn and uh, find things out. So we see a point of connection between Richard and his father. We see that he has a brother, Michael, who is very different, where people of means had sought out their father. Michael sought out people of means. We see that Michael is not like Richard, does not have that desire to know and learn and experience. He's not like their father who loved to travel. Michael is far more concerned with the local, the perception of importance and money and uh, politics. That's all this, these people of mean, the, the important people in town, that's all coming across. So from a reader perspective, all of this information is being fed to us. It is being spoon fed to us, it is right in our face, it's very, very obvious. And you can see how useful that is as a reader. In four paragraphs, we understand so much about Richard's backstory, about his family. And we know not only had their father died, but Michael had kind of tried to weigh them off and go, it's not important that you go there, that there's some tension between them. And also that Richard had been in the depths of despair. Now we know why, because his father had been murdered. There are lots of things going on and they are explained to us and we are very, very clear on it. So from a reader perspective, this is great. Why do I have a problem with it from the other side of the fence, from that sort of editorial author side? And part of it is, it's established that Richard is viewing this scene. He's looking at this vine. And then suddenly we have, these are not direct reminiscences that Richard is experiencing. We are, the narrator is ransacking Richard's history to pull out the pertinent information for the reader. This is not couched in internal monologue. It's not that Richard sees the vine and then remembers seeing it in his father's house. And that brought up memories of his father being dead and how Michael had done these things. Oh, if only he could turn to Zed, if only he'd ask Zed about this vine, because Zed knew about the vine. You can see, if it had been framed as Richard's internal monologue, if it had been that internal, almost stream of consciousness, because we can see the little points of connection, we can see that's underlying or trying to underlie all of this information, but it's being delivered 
as direct exposition to the reader. It's not being framed in the moment of the scene. And it's not a flashback. We are not jumping back in time to experience those scenes. It's a summation, a summary of those scenes. So what we have is a strange element of what we could call psychic distance. In the beginning, we see a vine and then we pull back and we realize that it's Richard is viewing this vine. And then we dive into Richard's mind and we get this sort of matter of fact, quite emotionless recalling of Richard's history. So it's not from Richard's point of view. It's not making us closer to Richard. But there are little moments that are obviously very good. Zed's rambling lectures. That's a really nice, colorful way to talk about Richard's feeling about Zed. Um, but that's how Michael perceived them, not Richard. Because Richard's brother, Michael, was a few years older. And having no interest in the woods or in Zed's rambling lectures, we can see that's being colored by Michael's perception of it. Because Richard enjoyed the discursive discussions he had with Zed. Rambling is how you would talk about it when there wasn't really a point. But that's not the sense that we get from Richard. Richard saw the sense that Zed was trying to impart, this wisdom, this knowledge that Zed was sparking Richard's hunger to learn, to know. Rambling lectures is not really fitting with that. So this is almost Michael's psyche that we are getting about five years before. So we, we are jumping around in time. Richard had moved away to live on his own, but he often stopped by his father's home, unlike Michael. So it's again, favoring Richard saying, Richard moved away to live on his own. We still don't know quite how old Richard is, but um, there's a nice contrast here. Unlike Michael, who is clearly always busy and rarely had time to visit. Michael's the bad son, Richard's the good son. So we're getting a qualitative sort of uh, interpretation of this information. But would Richard really feel that way about his brother? That it, it, it's awkward. This is not Richard's thought about his brother. It's kind of an interpretation of it from a more objective standpoint. This narrator who is standing back from the information, who is separate from Richard. And so in all of this, we get into this highly emotive moment, Richard finding out about his father being murdered. And it is rendered in very matter-of-fact language. Now, we know that Richard has had the fog of despair lifted from his mind before we get this paragraph. So we can understand, if you're in the fog of despair, you might mute things. You might make things very matter-of-fact. To, to protect yourself. But the fog of despair is meant to have lifted. And now we get, on the day three weeks before, when Michael had come to tell him their father had been murdered. It's very matter of fact. And again, jumping around in time three weeks ago, why it couldn't have been that day. Richard had gone to his father's house. Not Richard had rushed to his father's house. Richard ran to his father's house. Richard hurried to his father. Richard had gone. It's, it's very passive. Despite his brother's insistence, there was no reason to go, nothing he could do. That again, this isn't an argument between brothers. It, Michael is insisting, oh, there's no point in going. But we have nothing of Richard arguing back. We have nothing of Richard's reaction. We're, we're very distant from Richard's feelings about this. We're not experiencing the moment as Richard or from Richard's point of view. This is very matter of fact, very far back, very emotionless. Richard had long since passed the age when he did as his brother said. Right. This again, three weeks ago, my brother comes up to me and tells me my father, our father has been murdered and it's, and I shouldn't go. There's nothing to do. Well, I'm, I'm much older now and I don't have to do what you say. That's, that's the reaction. 
Wanting to spare him, the people there didn't let him see the body. But still, he saw the big, sickening splashes and puddles of brown, of blood, brown and dry across the plank floor. A, the body's been there for some time. B, who are these people? If these are the locals, the villagers, the, the people his father knew and he grew up around, why does he not recognize? These are faceless people. We're not getting the identity of any of these people. And there's no sense of anyone reaching out to him. There's no sense of anyone even sort of talking to him. When Richard came close, voices fell silent, except to offer sympathy, which only deepened the riving pain. That we're not seeing this scene. It's very muted. It's very matter of fact. It's a summation. And again, it's not deeply tied to Richard's perspective, his point of view. This is a summary, a backstory. And this is the problem I have. So like, one of the solutions for this is if you have taken a limited omniscient perspective and you're using this third person point of view, that you can intercut Richard's actions in the glee as he sees the vine, the internal monologue, you can use italics, his thought, I've seen this before, it was in my father's house. Then the, in normal font, like Richard stopped, a stab of pain as he remembered his father had been murdered. And you can move backwards and forwards through it. You can get all of this information across. There are different ways of doing it. But what we have here is the establishment of a style and a tone and a focus. And then a movement away for four paragraphs into a completely different style of narration from a different perspective with a different feeling and a different focus. Gone is that creation of the different senses with violence that is running through the scene of the, the Triffid or Audrey too from Little Shop of Horrors eating the other plant. That's not there anymore. This is just backstory and it's hurriedly put in place, even though some of it is very, very good. Like the blue clay jar, that wonderful image that stands out because we have those sharp images from our child. That, that is so wonderfully done. It's very evocative. It's something your eye catches on, your brain remembers that this is something that really stands out. Those things are really well done. And yet, Overall, it's just awkward. And then we finish off with that brilliant, really powerful end, which is suggesting then that this vine at the beginning is being tied into magic and because of his father's traveling. And that's where the, the vine had been formed. His father may have been involved in this. He traveled somewhere where there was magic. All of this is suggestive. So there's lots of really good stuff going on in this, par or in this section. The language, how, how good can pays attention to things like the brown, uh, brown and dry blood, because the blood wouldn't remain bright red forever. It does go brown. So that really gets across that the body had been there a while. And they are sickening splashes, that we get that, that sense of this reaction that, that Richard should be having. And yet, so much of the rest of it is that very reserved, matter-of-fact description of someone giving you the highlights of someone else's life. It's very separate. Now, part of this, you know, we, we, can, we can see that there are these intuitive leaps between the different paragraphs that we go from Richard sees a vine. He then thinks about, he doesn't know the name for this, but Zed's the one that taught him the names. But he has seen that vine before. He saw it in, his, in the blue clay jar that he gave to his dad. His dad, who was a traveler, and uh, you can see that sequence. And then it's, and when he thinks about his dad, he's obviously shying away from thinking about his dad being murdered, but that brings in thoughts of Michael. As soon as he thinks of his dad, he thinks of Michael. And Michael tried to, Michael never liked Zed and didn't like plants. And, um, Michael tried to stop him going to see his father's body after he had been murdered. There's kind of a logic to it, but it's not smooth. It's not, um, 
it's not focused in the way it's not optimized. That's perhaps a better way of describing it. It does the job for us as reader. There's enough there that we don't mind that it's slightly awkward, that it's in a slightly different tone and style and voice and, and point of view. That doesn't matter. We're getting the information that we want. And there's enough of a hint of a sequence to it that we're willing to forgive it. So as a reader, we're fine with this. But I think we can see from the other perspective that it's not quite fitting with the first two paragraphs. And actually, Goodkin could have gone back over this and found different ways to incorporate this information into the sequence of what was happening with Richard walking closer to the vine. It could have been integrated into the narrative instead of being this sort of uh, info dump dropped into the narrative and interrupting the scene. So I, I hope that you can see from this, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to come down on Goodkin for this. There is a reason why info dumping works as a technique. It is easy and accessible for a reader. It is spoon feeding us the information. We get this information so easily. We don't have to think. We don't have to work. We don't have to pause for a second to fully understand what is there. We're just being told it. And we, we move on to the next thing. We don't need to think about it. And I am not saying that Goodkin doesn't have good use of language. He clearly does have some wonderful use of language, some wonderful use of images and senses. That's really well done here. But I think in terms of stylistics, that this is not the neatest, smoothest, or most optimized way that Goodkin could have communicated this, that this is slightly rough, it is slightly awkward. And while it gets the job done, the goal of this should be not necessarily, does it get the job done, but does it get the job done well? And that's the thing. I think one of the things that separates good prose from bad prose, at either end of the, the, the scale, good prose not only gets the job done, but it does so beautifully, elegantly, succinctly, but in a way that is artistically pleasing. It combines both. Bad prose might get the job done, but it does it in a way that is ungainly or awkward or not particularly pleasant. But yes, it communicates the information, but I am not reading a book, a novel, a fantasy story, just for information. If I was, I could just read a summary of the book. I don't need to read the book itself. I am reading the book to experience the world, to live in this fictive reality, to escape the bounds of our world and inhabit this one just for a moment. And I want it to be immersive and beautiful and wonderful and exciting. This places rough edges around that experience, at least for me. But anyway, I hope this has been interesting. Um, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And I will see you in the next one.